Kitco News special coverage of the Precious Metal Summit is brought to you by Nucor Gold. We're back now with the founder of the Commodity Discovery Fund and the author of the well-known book, The Big Reset, Villa Middlecoop. Welcome back to Kitco. We've got a lot of big themes to discuss, wow. including- So much has happened. The Big Reset. You were on the show a couple of months ago, and even in the last three months, a lot of interesting, very important developments, like the European energy crisis that I'd like to touch on first. Everything is tied into the Big Reset that you're seeing signs of happening right now. You wrote this book uh, many years ago, and a lot of this, uh, a lot of the assumptions and predictions you've made are coming true today. Let's start by talking about what's going on in Europe, where well, you're from Amsterdam. The Dutch have been protesting uh, nitrogen and uh, many fertilizers, issues. many <laughs> issues. Yeah. And uh, of course, broadly speaking, there is what they call an energy crisis in Europe. Just looking at the Dutch gas futures, it's higher, eight times higher than their 10 year average. How much of this was due to Russia alone? Well, you know, we shouldn't forget that Putin said, I'm willing to keep supplying oil and gas to Western Europe, but I only have one, uh, one demand. You should pay me in rubles, in gold or Bitcoin. And then the Western countries, they said, well, we won't, we won't accept that. And that was the reason why Putin closed down uh, um, um, <laughs> the oil and gas to the West, and th and that that has resulted in some kind of market panic, and it was a short squeeze, and and now the citizens in Europe are confronted by energy bills which will be up three, four, five, uh, five times compared to last year, and we the Dutch are a pretty rich country, but you also have countries in Europe which are much poorer. And this will cause havoc in, in, a, in this is this how much of the household disposable income is energy in? Let's just take uh, the Dutch, for example. I think within the Dutch, it, it's quite reasonable. Okay. Maybe it's 10, 15 percent. Okay. But of course, the poor, uh, the lower income families are, are much more, uh, well, much more harmed by this. But you have countries in, in, in Eastern Europe, let's say Bulgaria or Romania or even Poland, where the income is much lower, so a much larger percentage of the income, the family income, is spent on food and energy. Because it's not only energy, it's right. also food going up. Right. So um, a lot of people are very nervous about the upcoming winter. Nervous. Should they be nervous? I mean, I've been reading headlines that, oh, oh my God, people won't make it through the winter. People in Germany are looking up the word firewood. Uh, the, if you look up the yeah. German word for firewood in Google Trends, that's been spiking up. Uh, people can't really, literally cannot afford to pay their electricity bills. This is, um, how much of this is overblown? I did a poll on Twitter. Yeah. And um, I think my followers are more than average well-to-do. Okay. Yeah. 25% said, I don't, it, it will not af affect me in any meaningful way. Another 25% said, uh, it keeps me awake at night. And there's 50% who say, I'm, I'm, I, I expect to have serious problems because of this. I, and I'm worried. So I was quite shocked about that. Mortgage rates, are they going up in Europe as well? Not that much, not, not that much. much. So no. that's not a problem. Okay. In the US, in US, you see 6%, 6.5%. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very troubling. But it's the full package which is very worrying now. And I think that's also the reason why the Fed can't keep uh, raising rates, what is needed to fight inflation. But there's a huge risk we'll end up with a huge economic crisis. Okay, uh, I want to come back to that. But first, let's talk about what the citizens can do now. I mean, what exactly, if you break down the consumer price index in Europe, which part of this basket is hitting the consumer the most? Is it energy? It's energy. Of it's course, energy. energy. Because, you, you know, you, you can choose whether you go on holiday or not. Yeah. You can't choose whether you heat your home or not. Of course, you can. Then there, especially elderly people who switch off the heating, and what they'll do, they'll join forces. So every night they'll have tea with one of the with one of them in one of one of the houses, and then the other five can can switch off the heating. 
So it is a very big problem and it's not an easy problem to solve for most for most to have a fixed income, especially when you're a pensioner. Yeah, it, this is difficult to understand for uh, Americans who are not experiencing natural gas prices yeah. to the extent because there's different forms of energy here. Uh, you've lived in Europe for a you know, majority of your life. Yeah. Have you experienced this before? No, and I think that's the biggest, that's what scares me. I've been doing many presentations on topics on, on monetary reset, financial crisis, and I always told the audience, we should be prepared that one day we'll have a real crisis in, in our lives. If you study history, every generation has this, has this big crisis, a yeah. war, economic crisis, and we never had one. We never had a serious crisis. If you're born after 1945, I was born in 1962, you then had a major crisis. And of course, people who are well to do, I took care of myself. And that's the reason why I started to invest in physical gold and silver in the yes. early 2000s, because I've been always been scared that one day a big crisis might arrive. But there are many people who are not prepared and they're, you know, they got used to, to, to the good life. Uh, let's talk about what happened here, because the natural gas prices started spiking in the last couple of months because Russia retaliated against yeah. the West. Just a few weeks ago, the G7 imposed a new sanction against Russia, which in turn prompted Moscow to basically cut off natural gas supplies yeah. to Europe. What is the next move? Do you think the G7 will capitulate, make some concessions? Maybe, maybe the Europeans will pressure the Americans to say, look, let's give the Russians something here. We're, we're entering a da dangerous phase in this conflict because Russia, is losing the war on the ground in Ukraine. If, if you watch um, the Russian television, um, even there they are openly discussing that they're losing this war. Putin is not a guy who can accept he's losing. So he's, he's a cornered animal in a way. There's even openly criticism within Russia now uh, towards Putin. So what will he do? Uh, and, and I think the next few weeks will be decisive. And I also speak, uh, I also speak experts who say uh, we shouldn't be too scared uh, about the coming winter because Putin might, you know, within Russia, they might solve the Putin problem. And then maybe another wind will blow from the east and there will be peace talks. But we don't know. I, I, I don't know either. Well, but it's I, a dangerous face. The, the common person in Europe is just wondering when their energy price or energy bills will return to normal. That's the only thing they, they talk about now. Yes. And, what is and, your... and many, many of them say we will stop paying. And, and they look to the government and the um, UK, the new UK uh, 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 prime minister already said, I will cover the extra cost. France is pivoting towards such a sub subsidizing of, of energy costs. So I think we'll see a lot of money printing. Yes. And that's the reason why the euro goes down that much, because there's a huge crisis developing within Europe, also within factories who, who use a lot of energy. Yes. And then you have the money printing, which, which, which is, will start to happen again. And that puts a lot of pressure on the euro and the whole euro system. Well, the subsidies in themselves could create a problem. I think it was brought up in a panel here at the conference that if you subsidize energy, people will just use more of it, creating more of a shortage, right? Oh yeah, it's, and that's a, it's a different balancing act for governments. But um, you know how governments are. If the pressure becomes too, 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 too large and people start to uh, demonstrate and revolt, yeah. Because you touched on the farmer protest. Yes. Uh, we, have, we have some more issues in, in Europe. We've got some more issues in the Netherlands. And, and I think um, when this energy crisis pushes people to the brink, you could have mass demonstration, even riots. And, and governments are afraid of that. So they'll choose the easy way and that's print money. Yeah. It has been proven, well, not proven, but discussed in academic research that economic instability has led to social unrest. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, yeah. so let's assume the government doesn't fix this problem. Let's assume that there's no peace deal between Ukraine and Russia, we'll touch on that. And the pr energy prices stay high. People can't afford to live the way they used to. What is the next logical step in this progression? What will people do? 
I think you'll have social unrest. You'll have uh, you'll see a huge a rising crime. You know, nowadays it's very easy to walk into a supermarket and leave without paying. Migration from Europe. There are huge problems. There are huge problems with refugees. Um, we have a very social uh, policy towards refugees compared to Australia and the US. So now in Holland, there's a huge discussion because if a refugee comes into our country and we, see, we, we, we check his credentials and we say, you're a real refugee, mm -hmm. we give you a home, we give you um, uh, money, we give you an allowance, right. but we don't give that to our own people. And you have the younger generation, they can't find homes anymore. So it, that builds up real tension. And maybe you followed what happened in Sweden with the elections. There was a, a huge swift from the left to the right. Do you so think, that's the risk as well. Do you think there will be mass migration away from Europe? Will Europeans no. think, no, enough with this, let's no, move no, no, to no, 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 America, no, Asia? No, no, no. no. no, no, no. Um, but I'm worried about this winter, but when this conflict isn't solved yeah. and when, when this conflict is turning more and more towards a World War III type of conflict between the East and the West, it, 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 maybe it's not a shooting war, but it's a financial economic war in a way. So that even the Pope warned about World War III because there's such huge tension. And then I'm worried what will happen in, in the next winter, not this winter, but the next winter. You're talking so, about literal winter, not figurative economic yeah. winter. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, okay, let's talk about this potential World War III because like you mentioned, we are in an economic war that we talked offline about is unprecedented. Even oh, yeah. during the Cold War, I didn't see both sides imposing sanctions on each other, uh, potentially using cyber technology and hacking and, uh, and causing major disruptions in the supply chain, boosting up energy prices up to the point of becoming unaffordable. Yeah. Have you never seen this before, have you? No, and, and I think it's a big trend change. Um, of course, we had a Cold War, as you said, in the 1950s, the 60s, 70s, and then we had the fall of communism. All former communist country actually took over our system. They all became capitalist in a way. And that was the best part of world history, maybe. And now, and now you know, it started with the economic war of, US, of um, um, President Trump against China. It started with the, uh, the actions against Huawei. Um, we have a Dutch company, ASML. They make the best machines to produce chips, computer chips. They're not allowed to export them to China anymore. And I think we're on the path of, um, of more conflict. And, and it's a path of deglobalization. And it's even a path away from the old Bretton Woods system in which we all supported paper assets, treasuries towards a system in which we are going to look to hard, hard assets and commodities and maybe even gold. This is a quote from uh, Charles Gave, who is a French financier. This is a quote from a book by Ronnie Peter Stoffler, the um, In Gold We Trust uh, report. Yeah. The world is breaking into two distinct economic zones, the empire of the sea or the western bloc of nations and the empire of the land or the eastern bloc. The former's currency is based on fiat money, and the latter, the Eastern Bloc, is based on the emerging tandem of commodities, gold, and oil. Tell us about this development. Uh, he's not the only one saying this. Yes. You have Zoltan Pozar. Zoltan Pozar is a former Fed official. He's now the strategist for Credit Suisse. He published four essays since the start of the Ukraine war. Mm -hmm. You can find them online. And he, he, he calls this the start of Bretton Woods 3.0. So, Bretton Woods 1.0, that was 1944, the start of the US dollar system. Yes. Then you had Bretton Woods 2.0, was in 1971, when the dollar was taken off the gold standard. And now, according to Zoltan Poza, we're entering Bretton Woods 3. And he also calls this a move away from, uh, well, collecting uh, paper assets, investing in US treasuries. And he even goes a bit a step further and he says, um, um, this Bretton Woods 3.0 is, 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 is a move to a system, a new monetary system based on commodities and gold. And we used to have this old 
uh, saying it's our currency and your problem that was pointed to the US dollar. And now he says it's, it's our commodities and your problem. So um, we used to have the just-in-time deliveries for commodities. And, and now you have the just-in-case deliveries of commodities. You should, you should build your own reserves of commodities. And that's a huge change. One could argue that basing a currency on a hard asset like gold is not a new monetary system. To make it completely new and to de-dollarize, we should move towards a digital form of a backing. Back it by either a crypto or a Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is a type of crypto, but another type of crypto yeah. or perhaps a new form of digital assets. Um, is that, why is that not being talked about by the BRIC nations? Well, before this crisis, before the Ukraine war, we were all looking at the financial system and telling each other that the next phase would be the arrival of central bank digital currencies. And we thought that would be the new phase and in a way a, a monetary reset. And yes. then the war started and now we have the BRIC countries, so Brazil, Russia, India, China, mm -hmm. Argentina just joined them. The Saudis have said they might join them. Now we have a group of over 140 countries who are not supporting the Western sanctions. So we only have a few dozen countries, the Western countries, who apply the sanctions on Russia. But the majority of the people live in countries, 6 billion people live in countries who don't support the sanctions. And we could have a move away from our dollar-based system to a system which is introduced by the BRICS countries. And they, they will say, we, 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 will, we will use our own system from now. And we see the first indications. We see the, the trading between the BRICS nations in which Russia is supplying cheap energy to India and China. Yeah. And India and China are paying with their own currencies. They're not paying with dollars anymore. So I, th I, I see this as the very first stage of a move away from this dollar system. Let's back up and examine why these 140 countries do not support the sanctions. You would think that they would like to align with still the world's most powerful economy, uh, but that's not the case. They're fed up okay. with the double standards of the US. Okay. They're fed up with the double standards of the West. When the West, when the US invaded Iraq, when the West, when the US invaded Afghanistan, mm -hmm. we didn't have sanctions against the US. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a world of double standards. And I live in the West. And, and I, I, ha I have a good life in the West, but I can't close my eyes for all the, well, the negative developments. And, and we in the West are so arrogant. And, and people in China, if you, if you speak with people from Asia, if you speak with people in the Middle East, yes. if you speak with people in Latin America and Africa, they're all fed up with the US, the IMF and the World Bank, and they, they don't want to be part of that anymore. And China, they have somewhere else to go now. China says, we'll, we'll help you. We'll give you cheap loans. We'll build your bridges. We'll build your railway. China was, uh, well, Russia was the largest supplier of Chinese oil for the last three months. So that in itself speaks to the relationship. They don't need the US is the message that Russia and China are communicating to the world. But what does this move away from the dollar mean for hard assets? Which assets will benefit the most from this move? Um, maybe all, but I think gold, gold, yeah. and gold in the end, and, and even silver will um, will have the largest advantage, um, be, and people people never understand. So how can how can gold be a great beneficiary of, of this of this of this change? While gold is going down now, but you've been long enough in financial markets to know the first move is the false move. So I think there's a huge demand for physical gold and silver. There was a study by Roman Manley on the physical silver yeah. go, uh, fleeing from the vaults in, uh, in London, right. in Chicago. Yes. So pretty soon we might reach a point where there will be um, maybe a divide between the paper price of 
silver and the physical price of silver. We've seen the same thing happening with palladium three years ago. There were a lot of paper shorts in palladium. Then there was too much demand for the physical stuff. The paper shorts needed to cover and palladium price went up 3x. And I think um, we could have the same development in gold, silver and also platinum. In terms of the price, a lot of investors in gold were disappointed that it only went to $2,000 yeah. in 2020. Yeah. If you look at the last bull cycle, it went from $300 to $400 in 2001, all the way to close to $2,000 in 2011. That's over a 10 year period, uh, almost eight times. Yeah. We did not go up eight times in the last cycle. It could happen in the next cycle. And the okay. next cycle is about to start. That's what I think. Okay. So we'll have the last decline for gold and silver can bring you back to 1600, maybe to 1500 briefly, and then it will turn and it will run. And, and I expect that to start later this year. And I think that will, and the, the catalyst for that move yeah. is, is the current crisis, geopolitical crisis. Because countries east of Germany, like Poland and Hungary, they're adding to their gold reserve and some are adding 10x to their gold right. reserves. The Eastern, I've noticed that the Eastern central banks have been very active in adding to their gold reserves where you've got the Western countries very inactive in doing that. And you know why? Because the Western countries are still the allies from the Second World War and they're there to support their big brother, which is the US. So they're not allowed, they're not allowed, they're told by the US, don't start buying gold because gold is the anti-dollar. But we stopped selling gold in the West yeah. and we're repatriating our gold from the US. And this has been ongoing for the last 10 years because this all started after the start of the Lehman crisis. After the start of Lehman crisis, Russia and China started to buy a lot of physical gold. And now we get into the end game of this, of this US dollar, uh, dollar, um, uh, based uh, financial system. And, and, and actually, I think these are the first stages of the monetary reset. And when we look back in, in 10 years from now or eight years from now, when we look back in 2030, we'll say, Jesus, so much has changed in the last few years. According, depending on what study you look at, but up to 65% of global trade is still done with the US dollar. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about how that's going to change. Exactly how would it change? Which currencies could take up more of the pie? Well, I gave the example. Russia supplying cheap energy to India and China. They pay with their own currency. Mm. Maybe it's just 1% less foreign trade in, 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 in dollars. So you go from 65 to 64, and next year it goes from 64 to, to 62. Yeah. And, and you know, often these changes, they start with small changes, and then you have the big... They're making their own currency. Can they start transacting in gold? No, but there's a risk that the BRIC countries, and there have been some statements by Russians that they're studying to build their own financial system, the BRIC system, yes. and that could be gold-backed or gold-related. Gold so they're, they're flirting with the idea. It's a challenge to the US-based SDR. Oh yeah, oh yeah, when that would happen. And then, and then we could end into a very serious financial economic conflict between the East and the West. And of course, we know that um, you have people in the US who say we better fight China now than in 10 years time, because in 10 years time, the, the Chinese Navy and the Chinese military will be, become stronger. Well, mm -hmm. and, I'm, I'm a bit afraid that the, the same forces who brought regime change to the Ukraine is documented. Uh, the US invested 5 billion in regime change in Ukraine. So the US pushed Ukraine towards war. The same forces can push for war with China as well. I'm gonna posit a theory to you. This is my own theory. Feel free to disagree with it. But the next conflict between the East and the West could be fought over rare earth minerals. This is an article that you actually brought to my attention. Yeah. I'm just gonna read a few paragraphs here. The, 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 this is from the European Union, yeah. uh, European Commission and study on critical raw materials. It says, lithium and rare earths will soon be more important than oil and gas. Our demand for rare earths alone will increase fivefold by 2030. We must avoid becoming dependent again as we did with oil and gas. So I think they're learning their lesson with Russia. And oh, yeah. the hidden line is who's the biggest supplier of lithium right now in the world? 
um, China. Yeah, and they also say we will then identify strategic projects along the supply chain mm. from extracting to refining. And this was said in the state of the European Union speech by the president of the European Union. I've never seen something like this. So this will be huge for the world of commodities. We are commodity investors. And I think commodities have had a very, well, um, well, we've been in this long bear market. It, it, it was struggling to survive, but, but everything going on now, the supply and demand, the shortages, which are all expected to arrive around 2025, yes. uh, all countries willing to build their own reserves now. Um, so this, this will be very good for the mining space. And I, I, of course, I'm talking my book here. Yeah, of course. Well, everybody yeah. is. Yeah, but I can't see how this will be bad for our industry. I mean, very good points you brought up. But just in the first sentence, lithium and rare earths will be soon more important than oil and gas. Do you agree with that? Uh, no, I was, I, was, I was surprised by that statement. I, yeah. I would have said copper and nickel. <laughs> okay. Because rare earth is such a small market. But why do they say rare earth? Because 90%, 95% of the rare earth production yeah. comes from China. Yes. And they, they need rare earth in very small quantities, but they need it in their green revolution. So that's why they pick it. And I think they, they also think this communicates better with the broader audience instead of nickel or, uh, or copper. I understand the trend. Electric vehicles, electrification yeah. of everything needs a lot of rare earths. Copper is not a rare earth, but it's a base metal yeah. that's needed. Cobalt, yeah. lithium, silver, and everything. Nickel. Yeah, nickel. But zinc as well. That's why we invest in all of these metals and even uranium. Yeah. Even uranium gets more important yeah. because you need uranium in, in, when you have a move away from fossil fuels and you go to the green, well, solar and wind energy, we have weeks in Europe in November, there's no sun, there's no wind. So you need uranium for your base case. To say that oil will become less important is to assume that the electrification movement will be successful. Well, they push it at, at Brussels. Our government in Brussels, the European Union, they agreed that from 2035 only EVs are allowed to be sold. This will become another crisis because imagine Germany with the long distance. But it's, a, it's, it's becoming a law now. You have to build charging stations on the autobahn. Oh yeah, but, but imagine go, during the holiday weekends, yeah. it, will be, it will be chaos. Chaos. So bottom line, uh, Willem, let's put this all together. Uh, you think that gold will have a lot of potential for investors long term for the reasons you outlined. You think that there is no peace in sight for the medium term? Well, no, no. I hope. I hope to change. I hope the fact that Russia is losing the land war in Ukraine yeah. will bring some kind of change within Russia maybe even some kind of regime change, mm. but that's my hopeful scenario. And when that, that doesn't happen, we're in for a very rough ride. Yeah, maybe another Vietnam for Russia, if people have been making that analogy. I'm not so worried about Russia, I'm more worried about what will happen in the tensions between US and China. That's oh, the big one. That's okay. the big one. I want to come back to that statement when uh, some people have said that it's better to fight China now than, you know, 10 years time. If you assume that conflict is inevitable, that makes sense. You should strike while the iron is, I guess, less hot now and, you know, have an advantage. Will that happen? I don't know, but it's my biggest worry. Um, and of course, we have Taiwan <laughs> yes. as, as, as a big, um, well, well, don't look what 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 the US says, but look at what what the actions are. They send Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan, and, and that's that's a strategy of confrontation. Some people and in provocation. Taiwan, some people in Taiwan protested that actually. Yeah. They did not want more trouble. But they did the same in Ukraine. Yeah. They invested five billion to get regime change. They flew in Saakashvili, who was the president of Georgia to make him governor of Odessa. They flew in um, an official from the State Department and, and that person was nationalized into a Ukraine citizen that day and she became a minister of, uh, of finance. 
So this was a US planned coup. And I see the same strategy of provocation and confrontation towards China now. And Taiwan, Taiwan might be used the same way Ukraine was used. Yes, well, the American historian Graham Ellison has written that uh, out of the, I think, 16 historical examples of nations rising to power, yeah. uh, I think 12 of them have resulted in armed conflict between a superpower and a rising superpower. Yeah, and that's always when there's a change yeah. in, in the leading power in the world. And often we have these changes once in the 80 or 90 years. And you have the famous book, The Fourth Turning, touch upon this as well. Yes. It, when did the Second World War start? This was 1940. At 80 years is 2020. Yeah. Yeah? When did the Second World War end? 1945. At 80 years is 2025. So we're in the same, let's say, period of crisis. Okay. And after the crisis, there was always a new spring. So to sum up and to close off, besides gold, which other assets will survive these crises, will survive the big reset you're talking about? Uh, silver might benefit most okay. because it's poor man's gold. Yes. It's the only metal trading at uh, less than 50% of the 1980 high. Yes. Um, it's, it, there will be shortages in silver. Silver is needed for the Green Revolution. Gold is not needed. And um, uh, central banks don't have silver in their vaults to suppress the price. So I think um, there will be a huge crisis around silver. And when this crisis arrives and the paper silver system breaks down, the COMEX system, you could uh, see silver going from $17 to $100 within one or two weeks. One or two weeks. Yeah. I don't even think that happened in 1980. No. <laughs> wow. You will be that shocked. Is very, <laughs> that and is I, a shock. I'm not the first one who has been calling for this. You might remember Eric Sprott. Yes. He's a student of the silver market. He retired. He understands this market very well. His largest investments are in silver companies now. Okay. Okay. His private investments. And this is just going to come from the market forces you described. We don't need a entity no. squeezing no. it. But... China and Russia understand the precious metal markets very well. They study it very well. Yeah. When they really want to do harm to the US, they'll buy all the gold and silver in the world and collapse the paper dollar system that way. Yeah. But the Chinese understand that will be seen as an act of war. Yes. Uh, people want to, let's talk about the rare earths and then we'll close it off there. They, they want to become less dependent. The West wants to become less dependent on China. Is that even an option? No. Are there reserves here? No. No. So and and you, can, you, well, you can have a speech in the State of the Union in Brussels and say, we'll start to build our own reserves and we start to develop our own projects. We both know a bit about mining. Once you discover a project, it's very difficult to discover a project. Yeah. You need to develop it. It takes you at least seven, eight years and often up to 15 years. And this crisis is now. So, well, yeah. we, we have a problem. After <laughs> reading this speech, are you more bullish on the miners? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, I've had a meeting with the Yukon government yesterday. And I sent them this piece. They hadn't seen it. They had ambassadors coming in in the last few months looking for projects because they are looking for, well, to secure their supplies. And the Yukon government, when they saw this piece from Brussels, they were very, very interested, also shocked that, that this is the language coming from Brussels now. And, and I talked to the government of the Yukon and actually advised them we should set up a, a new fund for exploration to, to uh, speed up exploration for resources. And we should build a fund of, let's say, $250 million. And we should ask the producers to put money in. We should ask the governments to put money in. We should ask... Well, almost everybody to, to put money in because we need to speed up exploration. Yes. There are not enough discoveries. And we, with, with our fund, have invested more than $100 million into exploration. A few other funds like Crescat have been doing the same. Yes. But we're the only ones. We're the only ones. Yes. Well, I think uh, this is definitely the right time to be, uh, to be looking at the sector if governments are yeah. making speeches like this. So. Yeah, so I hope there will be a government-sponsored... Uh, well, um, initiative 
to really uh, support the exploration space. The Biden administration has invested $2 billion for uranium, actually, recently. Yeah, that, that's true. But we don't see any of that money flowing towards the exploration space. So there's no more drilling, yeah. no more discoveries. But you need an initiative like that. And, and maybe even Brussels need to invest 50 or 100 million in, in, in an exploration fund. In, so uh, countries like Canada and Australia can do more exploration. Okay. Well, William, I, William, I could appreciate your thoughts. I could speak to you for hours. Uh, thank you so much for coming back on Kitco. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin. Kitco News special coverage of the Precious Metal Summit is brought to you by Nucor Gold.